May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, Josan, Hailego uh, Sing Ling Gong Lam Chat, Ngo Song Do De Ne De, Lege Jat Ge Zip Doi, Dean KK, Tung Mai Le Dong So, Jang Gung Zok, Si Fung Ge Jan, Yun Zu. Zuk fuk bu saune de. Doze. That's your Cantonese for the morning. Enough speaking in tongues for me. Pentecost commemorates several events. Principally, it marks the coming of the Holy Spirit after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. A frightened group of bereft disciples are suddenly empowered by the Spirit, and that results in the birth of the church. Luke, who is the writer of the book of Acts, begins his work by describing this Holy Spirit settling on the disciples like tongues of fire. The disciples become apostles sealed and aflame by the Spirit. The use of this word tongue is really important here. Tongues of flame speaking in tongues. According to Luke, the disciples can stand before a vast and cosmopolitan crowd, much like this morning's congregation, and address every person in their own language, not like this person. Suddenly, the apostles become multilingual, with the gospel being preached in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Cantonese, English. In the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 11, we have another story about language, but this is the one where language goes very badly wrong. It's the story of the tower at Shinar, or Babel, as it's better known. And the story in Genesis goes like this. Once upon a time, all the nations spoke with one voice in one tongue in one language. But then people got ideas above their station, and they decided to build a tower to heaven to get on a level with God. By the way, this doesn't sound like a very convincing building project from the word go, but never mind. Uh, God, as I'm sure you understand, uh, guards his privacy rather jealously. And so he sows dissension among the builders by inventing new languages that hamper the construction. Shiner is renamed Babel, from which we get the English word babble. And it's a term, by the way, very closely linked to another English word, barbarian, which is a phonetic name for people we don't understand or respect. English people used to think that barbarians just spoke like this, blah, 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 blah. That's all apparently barbarians ever said. I think they were probably wrong, but that's not the first time that the English have been wrong. Anyway, what happened at Babel, not for the first time, and in an ominous warning to all future building projects, things go very badly wrong if people can't communicate in the same language. It doesn't really matter whether you've got a good architect or a project manager, you need a common language. Now, this account in the book of Acts is probably, I think, an attempt to completely reconstruct and redeem this fable. The message is this, and I think it's obvious. This new church, which is a construction of the Spirit, is one in which everybody can speak in their own tongue, but all can be understood and treated equally. 
So the first act of the Holy Spirit is to reverse the tragedy of the Tower of Babel. God now speaks to everybody in their own language, not just to the Jews, not just to the Romans or to the Greeks, but everyone, everywhere, in every tongue. The church has, in other words, a common language. And no, it's not Latin, nor is it English, nor is it Book of Common Prayer English. The language is of the Holy Spirit. The language is, in other words, of God's Spirit, and that is pure love. Now, it's, I think, quite important not to take this story in the Book of Acts too literally. When early Pentecostal missionaries in the very uh, early 1900s thought that they had received the Book of Tongues, um, they often assumed that they just needed to find the nation or the people or the tribe that corresponded to this new exciting language that they appeared to have acquired. I should say that nobody really believes this in Pentecostalism anymore. A teacher of mine a long time ago who specialized in primal religion, he studied the Nua and the Dinka tribe in Nigeria, and he spoke the languages of those people he studied. He was actually a Roman Catholic priest, but because he was a trained anthropologist, he loved to visit charismatic and Pentecostal churches in South Africa when he went on sabbatical. And when the time came for the congregation to speak in tongues and to prophesy, my friend would often chip in and speak one of the primal languages that he spoke, a little bit of Dinka, tiny bit of Nua. The congregations who looked at this rather overweight priest who was dressed entirely in black were really impressed. And then somebody would say, I think our brother has a word from the Lord from us. Does anybody have an interpretation? Aha, well, this is getting to the nub of it, isn't it? And somebody would invariably stick their hand up and say, I believe I do and would proceed to translate. Something like this. Uh, Thus says the Lord, and then it would continue in that vein. What my friend was doing every single time was repeating a recipe for making porridge out of goat stock, which is a little bit unfair of him, but the point is made. He's not speaking in tongues, he's speaking Nyur or Dinka, and he's giving us a recipe for how to make porridge out of goat stock. If you think about it for a moment, speaking in tongues isn't a language in that sense. It's what Paul says later in the New Testament, sighs and sounds too deep for words. If you ever hear tongues being spoken, it is beautiful very often, absolutely beautiful. But most linguists agree that these tongues are not a language, not in the way that Cantonese or English might be. It's what you might call an ecstatic utterance, a kind of sound salad. It's full of meaning, it's full of feeling, but it hasn't got a vocabulary or a grammar or anything else that could make it be translated literally. It's about how the worshipper feels in relation to God and how the congregation respond to that utterance. So what does that all mean for us? Well, first, I suppose I want to say that tongues Although it can't be a language, it's something far more interesting and deeper. It's what a friend of mine calls an overflow of praise. It's actually a description of what happens when we finally realize that rational thinking, rational process, even liturgy is not enough. 
sometimes words praising God will not do. And when people resort to babbling and speaking in that kind of way, the tongue kind of way, you have a kind of verbal, almost improvised jazz. This is music that's not written down, but it is played and performed, and you can hear it, and you can be moved by it. You probably can't say, play it again, Sam, because it will come out differently next time. But that's all right. It's a recognition that sometimes praising God words are not enough. The second thing this does is it reminds us that God who was and is incarnate remains radically available to all of us in our own tongue and our own contexts and places and languages. We hear the gospel in a tongue we can understand because God speaks to us in our culture. That's what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Don't try and make the English Latin. Don't try and make the Cantonese English. Instead, hear the gospel that Jesus speaks in your language. And thirdly, we also remember that sometimes languages are hierarchical and privileged, and there is a refusal to hear other words. I think one of the great things over the last, I'd say, 75 years, since the last war, has been the amazing way in which what we might call minority interests, but they're really majority interests, have come to the attention of the church and gradually spoken and praised in different ways. Black theology, Asian theology, feminist theology, liberation theology. These speak different languages. Not so long ago, they would have been classed as bad language. We don't want to hear that kind of talk here. But the Spirit says to us, listen. The Spirit is speaking through that person, through that minority, through that majority. Hear the word of God to the church from these people. The apostles spoke in all kinds of tongues on the day of Pentecost. They really did. And I think it's important for us to understand that for some people who heard the gospel in their own tongue, that would have been the first word spoken in the public space that they would ever have heard in their tongue because nobody would speak their language. It was regarded as, well, unimportant or even offensive or just wrong. So suddenly to hear somebody talking as you do when your own language and speech is repressed is a powerful thing. One Caribbean writer, a man called Courtright Davis, says this, we've begun to educate ourselves about the new surges in theologies in the third world. We realized that theological norms arise from contexts in which one's life and faith are not culture free and that our church structures are not easily translatable from one place to another. So although, he says, the gospel and God and Jesus and the Spirit is the same from one place to another, how the gospel is understood and articulated and spoken and lived is going to be different in every different place. Put this another way, Pentecost is saying to us that Christianity is always spoken in your tongue. Jesus spoke Aramaic, some Greek, knew some Latin, and certainly some Hebrew. 
he was able to converse with the people around him. Pentecost is about hearing the many tongues of God's Spirit and remembering that the language of the Spirit, which is love, pure love, and equality and attentiveness and listening, is the same the world over. It's just that everybody in every place has a local accent. Pentecost also tells us that the soul is now a light. It's another kind of tongue, the tongue of fire. We have to work hard on translation and interpretation in the meantime. Tongues of fire are there for light and warmth and purification. They point us forward. That's why at Pentecost, the church is born. The last thing I want to say today is to remind you that at Pentecost, there was an awful lot of disruption, huge amounts of disruption in that public square as everybody heard for the first time the universal God speak to everybody of a universal faith in their own language. We sometimes think, and maybe dwell, on the fact that the Spirit is the Spirit of comfort, but we forget that the same Spirit convicts, disturbs, and urges. And the Spirit that rests on us today and drives us out into the world is the same Spirit that settled on the Apostles and drove them into the marketplace. Here are some words from Bishop Richard Holloway. We want a quiet life, we Christians do. The life of the graveyard, where little happens, but where we can water the flowers, gaze at the gravestones, and remember the past with affection. But our God is a grave buster, a tombstone roller, a wandering God calling us to leave the graveyard and follow him to Galilee. To be a Christian, we must resign ourselves to an exciting, risky life. Well, there's an English phrase if you ever heard one. We must resign ourselves to an exciting, risky life. Yes, we must. Being a Christian is risk-taking. The life of spirit-filled risk awaits us all. If you like, the handbrake is off, the foot is on the accelerator, not the brake, and we are asked to get moving. The profound disturber, the uncompromising comforter, propels us all today. It anoints us to proclaim the kingdom of God. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Our moon, our men. God bless you.